then that middle part is so important. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word, by speaking their testimony. As we testify about the victory of Christ and what he has done for us through his precious, you know, cross, we gain victory over the enemy. Now, Jesus has defeated the devil, but that is made manifest in our life as we let our words agree with what he has done. Thank God, Jesus said, it is finished. He has defeated the enemy. Satan bruised his heel, but Jesus crushed his head. And we need to testify to what Jesus has done, but expanding on that, we need to testify to the truth of all that God has said in his word. All that Jesus Christ has done, everything the scripture declares to us. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And though God's declarations are true, they only become established in our lives as we agree with them. I'm gonna say that again. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. All of God's declarations are truth, but they only become established for us personally as we set ourselves in agreement with them. The word or the utterance of our testimony, because Jesus has shed his blood and defeated the devil, as we testify and agree and add our witness to what God has already said and to what Christ has already done, it brings that victory into our lives personally. You know, there are some people that have been bound their entire lives. They've lived small, contained lives because of the words that were spoken over them or spoken to them throughout their life by some authority figure. It may have been a parent, it may have been a teacher, said, you're stupid, you can never get it. Uh, you know what? Jesus wants to break us out of that. We're going to be talking about the power of words today. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible about a man named Jabez. His name means he will cause pain. And he prayed a prayer to God, and part of his prayer was, God, make it so that I don't cause pain. In other words, I've been labeled and put in a box my whole life. This has been spoken over me. God, break me out of it. And God answered his prayer. And friend, if you've been bound by the words that have been spoken to you, you know what? God can set you free, and you can set your life on a whole new course. We're going to be talking about the power of words today. You're not going to want to miss a single moment of today's study. I mean, think about Jesus in the wilderness, tempted by the devil. The devil says, turn these stones into bread. Jesus is hungry, big time. What does Jesus do? He testifies and adds his agreement to the scripture. He says, no, Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He put the word of God in his lips. Satan takes him up on the, 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 the temple, throw yourself down. You know, the scripture says the angels will bear you up in their hands. Jesus said, it is written, put the word of God in his mouth again. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Third temptation comes. Satan says, look, kingdoms of the world, it's all mine, been delivered to me. I'll give it to you. Just fall down and worship me. Again, Jesus testifies. Jesus puts the word of God in his mouth, says, no, the scripture says, thou shalt worship the Lord your God, and he alone you shall serve. Get behind me, Satan. Now, if Jesus, in his confrontation with the devil, if the Son of God, the spotless Son of God, had to put the word of God in his mouth when confronted by evil, how much more do we need to do the same? We're to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Proverbs 16, verse 13, the R stands for right words. Proverbs 16 and verse 13. Righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him who speaks what is right. The word right there means honest, means true. The Message Bible says, good leaders cultivate honest speech. They love advisors who tell them the truth. When it comes to the astonishing power of words, we need to be speakers of truth. Yes. Ephesians 4.25 says, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. 
If you make a habit of speaking the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. But liars have to have an excellent memory. And eventually their lies become unraveled because they tell something a little different the next time. But if you just tell the truth, you don't have to worry about remembering things. And uh, if you'll tell the truth as we read from this verse, you'll become a valued counselor. But I do want to say when it comes to speaking the truth, we need to do what it says in Ephesians 4, 15, that we, we grow up into Christ as we speak the truth in love. Everyone say in love. You see, we need to be speakers of truth, but that truth needs to be insulated with love. Truth was never meant to be a club to hit someone with. You know, the same electricity that heats our home and, and heats the kettle for a cup of tea and cooks our food can kill you if it's not properly insulated. I remember when I was a little boy, and I don't think I ever told my dad this, so he's going to hear the story tomorrow when he's in church. <laughs> We're staying at my grandparents' house, Mimi and Pappy's, my, my dad's mom and dad. And... Uh, I was, it was probably 1958, and I'm fooling around in the house there, and I went behind the chair, and they had this old electric cord and went from the lamp, and there was a place on the wire that was exposed. And being curious and being three years old, I grabbed the exposed wire, and it fried my fingers and sent me across the room. In fact, I was out for, I don't know how long, but I, I came to. I mean, it, it knocked me over and knocked me out. I never did tell anybody. I thought I'd get in trouble. I figured I'd done something bad. But you know, there are some people, they'll tell you the truth, but when they're done, you feel like a steamroller has gone over you. I remember when I first came to Christ, there was this one guy, he was sort of in the, the hippie community of Christians there, and um, this guy knew the Bible. I think he could quote most of the New Testament, and I spent a fair bit of time with him. But whenever you got done with him, you just felt terrible because you just beat you up one side and down the other with the Scriptures. There was nothing edifying about what he did at all. It was never insulated in love, never. You know, the Bible talks about a word spoken in due season. That's the right word spoken at the right time in the right way. You can speak a right word, but if you do it at the wrong time in the wrong way, it can cause damage rather than good. It was the other guys in the church as well, a couple of the hippie Christians. Um, there was a, a couple that came to the church and got saved, and they were in Bible study, or actually it wasn't a church, it was just sort of a house meeting thing. And they would come to the Bible study, and they were there for several months and, and got themselves Bibles and stuff, but they weren't married. They were just living together. And, uh, you know, they'd quit smoking dope, and, and, I mean, they were on fire for Jesus. And, and the brothers in the little community there just began to earnestly pray. These guys had been in, in fellowship in, in the, the Christian group for three, four months, and these guys began to pray, said, you know, we, we, we've got to talk to them. We just need to do it in the right way at the right time. They prayed that the Holy Spirit, you know, would, would begin to influence them, but that they became convinced, and, and I, they talked with me about it, that they should go and talk to this couple about living together and not being married. And so they went there, and they went in love. Says, brother, we are just so glad. You know, you're, you're in church, and you're part of the family, and you're just one of us, and we love you with all of our hearts and all of our souls. We just want to bring something to your attention. You know, we want you to consider it. You know, the scripture is pretty clear that, that you know, if a man and woman are, are going to sleep together and, and have sexual relations, they need to be married. And we know you love this girl, and we just want to tell you, you, you need to get married to her, or else you guys need to part ways. And uh, said, look, we, we, we'll be happy to do the wedding for you. We'll, we'll arrange it. We'll do the whole deal. And he said, and it was a little, you know, uh, I guess th thrown off balance by their, their, their candor. But he came back to them a couple days later and he thanked them. He says, you guys, you're right. I've been searching the scriptures and, and I've made Jesus and the word of God my final authority. My girlfriend and I talked about it 
And you know what? We're, uh, we're in love with each other. We want to get married. We don't want to get married yet. We want to put it off for a few months. And so we're going we're gonna to separate. And we're not going to live together until we get married. And will you guys please do our wedding for us? You know, they, they could have gone in there like the other guy and rolled over him with the steamroller of truth and probably driven them out of fellowship and given them a, a bitter taste in their mouths about Christianity. But they spoke that do word in season. They insulated the truth with love. All right, moving right along. D, death and life. Death and life. Proverbs 18, just a page or so over. Proverbs 18 and verse 20. In Proverbs 18 and verse 20. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips, he shall be filled. I want you to notice your lips produce something. Verse 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Our words, according to the Scripture, are like seeds, and they do produce a harvest in our life. Now, I want you to just look at me, just, just for effect. Give me your attention for a second. What I'm talking about right now doesn't get any more serious. This is death and life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And those that indulge in it for death or life, if they speak words of death, they will eat the fruit of that in one form or another. Those that speak life will eat the fruit of that in one form or another. A man's life will be filled by the fruit of his mouth. Death and life, the scripture says, are in the power of the tongue. You know, the New Testament is pretty strong on this same thing. Just look in the book of James with me, if you would. Just real quick, book of James. And look in chapter 3. James chapter 3 and verse 2. James 3 and 2. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word... He's a perfect, and that word perfect means fully mature man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in the horse's mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they're turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a force the little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body, and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Now, he uses three different analogies there. First, he says, man, your tongue, it's, it's like a bit in a horse's mouth. And a rider on a horse can turn that horse any direction he can. And if you'll control your tongue, you can control your whole body by controlling your tongue. You know, when I was a kid, we used to ride horses quite a bit. And I remember we'd go to the stables early in the morning and get them before anyone else had ridden while the horses were fresh. We went one morning, and the stable hands said, hey, boy, you know how to ride? I'm like a skinny little 80-pound-year-old, you know, 80-pound kid. I said, yeah, I can ride. They said, yeah. I said, no, I can ride. One stable hand looks at the other one and gets this look on his face. says, get king for him. And I knew what was coming. I'm just a little kid, and I know what they're doing to me. So they bring out this big bay horse. I get on King, and in the first 20 minutes, King tried to throw me over a cliff, tried to rub me off on an overhanging branch, and tried to rub me off on a fence. But this little 80-pound kid holding onto those reins that are attached to that bit, I fought that horse, and in 30 minutes, King was no longer King. He had an 80-pound king sitting on his back telling him what to do. And when my couple hours of ride were, we came dancing back and the stable hands were there, said, how was the ride? I said, just fine. <laughs> control your tongue, control your body. And then he said, a tongue's like a rudder on a ship. You know, as a little boy, I stood on Long Beach Pier while the Queen Mary sailed into Long Beach. It's massive. And I've been up there where the pilot is, and I've turned the wheel. But you know, he turns that wheel and it turns the rudder back there. He could have run that, that, that great ship onto the rocks if he turned the rudder the wrong way. He could have run into 
one of the oil islands out there if he'd turned the rudder the wrong way. But instead, he deftly brought it into the harbor and brought it to where the tugboats could then begin to shove it into, you know, its present home. Well, friend, your tongue is like the rudder on a ship. And some people, they've run their marriage into the rocks of divorce because of that thing right there. Some people have run their business into the ground. They've destroyed relationships. They've affected their whole life because of their tongue. Think about the words you're saying. You are setting the direction of your life. I didn't make this up. James, James said it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it gets stronger. He said the tongue's like a fire. He said it sets on fire the whole course of nature. And that phrase literally means the wheel of our existence. It paints the picture of your life being like this hub with different spokes going out. One spoke is, is your relationship with God. One spoke is your family. Another spoke is your children. One spoke is your friendships. Another spoke is your business. Another spoke is your mental well-being. Another spoke is your physical health, and on and on. And it says the entire wheel of existence is set on fire by your tongue. Some people, their marriage has burned down around them. Or they've burned their own health down around them. They've burned relationships down to the ground. Ruined their own lives because they never got control of their own tongue. And I was staying with some friends recently and they had uh, candles burning all over the house. It was pretty cool and one of the candles, there was this big pop in the bathroom. We went in and one of the candles had been too close to the mirror and heated up the huge, beautiful bathroom mirror and just <laughs> cracked the whole mirror. But you know what? One little flame on a candle, a candle falls over, it can burn a house down. And once the house is burned down and you look around and you're standing in the charred ashes, it's hard to realize that a little tiny flame brought the whole thing down. The scripture says death and life is in the power of the tongue. It's like the bit in the horse's mouth. It's like the rudder on the ship. It's like a match. And it says, and it finds its inspiration. It's set on fire by hell. That means that the devil is after your tongue. He'll put thoughts in your mind, but ultimately what he's after is your tongue. Think about this. The book of Genesis. You know, it's so cool. God said... It became. God said it was. God said, boom, there it is. God said, wow. God said, they're flying around. God said, they're swimming in the sea. God said, and it happened. God said, and it happened. God said, and it happened. And then God made man in his own image, in his own likeness, <laughs> with the ability to speak words that influence, words that can bring death or life, words that can influence your own personal world. No wonder Jesus talked so straightforwardly about words. You see, words connected to the heart can change an eternal destiny. Words that are connected to our insides have power. I'm just talk talking about anything you say. I mean, I say stupid stuff on purpose. I say stupid stuff to be funny, but it's not something connected to my inside. But the things that I say as a habit of life that are connected to my heart, they have impact. They will affect my relationships. They will affect my marriage. They will affect my health. They, they will affect me mentally. They will affect the opportunities, you know, that I experience in life. I mean, consider this. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead. Confess him with your mouth as Lord, you'll be saved. People are saved by speaking words. The most radical, supernatural thing that could happen to a person. Your eternal destiny is changed from hell to heaven by speaking words. You're transferred from darkness into light by speaking words. You're taken out from the jurisdiction of the devil and put into the kingdom of God's dear son by speaking words. You're an enemy of God and suddenly become a son or a daughter of God by speaking words. Yes. Words connected to your heart and the Holy Spirit overshadows you and changes your spirit and you're suddenly born, of God, born again of God and made fit for heaven. Why should it be hard to believe that things of lesser import could be affected by our speech? 
like our relationships and our health, et cetera, et cetera. Which brings us to the final thing, the S, and that's salvation. I just quoted it to you. If you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess him with your mouth as Lord, you'll be saved. For with a heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with a mouth, confession is made, resulting in salvation. When heart and lips join together, it's not just an empty confession. Any parrot can be taught to say a sinner's prayer. That doesn't save the parrot. But when you believe something in your heart and it connects with your mouth, power is released. You might say, well, Bayless, I, I believe in my heart. Jesus died. Believe he's God's son. Believe he was raised from the dead. That's great. You're halfway there. If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, God brings you into a relationship called salvation. It's no light thing we're talking about. A person that does that, genuinely does that, everything changes. And I guarantee you God's going to start messing with your life in a very, very good way. He will challenge you. He will deal with you. He will walk with you. He will talk with you. He will not leave you the way you are because he loves you too much. It's not something that we do lightly. I'd like you to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment. We're going to pray. Jesus, wow. Thank you for loving us so much that you would spill your precious blood, that you would paint the cross red and soak the ground below it with your very life to redeem us. We know the price has been paid. Nothing can be taken from it or added to it. It just need be believed. I thank you for doing what only you can do by your Holy Spirit this night. Convicting, convincing hearts. Lord, if people will look around them more than likely they can see the Holy Spirit's work in changed lives and people that they know. And no doubt you've been knocking on the door of their hearts for some time. Friend, I want to ask you, as we have some musicians come up on the stage, I just want to ask you to pray with me to Put heart and lips together in a confession of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Nobody looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. If you've come in here tonight and you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, if perhaps... You've been away from God. You've had an encounter with him at some point in your life, but right now you're far from him. It's time to come home, and I want to tell you, God is not mad at you, friend. He loves you. He loves you. I want you to pray with me right now. God sees that heart of yours, and you need to put heart and lips together. I can give you the words, but that is the extent that I can do. Only you can put a sincere heart behind them. If you've never embraced Jesus and put your faith in him as Lord and Savior, here's your opportunity to do it. God will not turn you away. You can have a clean slate, friend, if you'll come to him. If you're away from God, time for you to reconnect. Start your life afresh. And I want you to pray with me. To say, oh God, with my whole heart, I believe Jesus is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay for all of my sins. I believe he was raised from the dead. Tonight I make a decision. I ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Jesus, I'm giving you my heart. 
Wherever you lead me, I will go. Thank you for rescuing me and giving me a new life. You are Lord. It's an amazing thing if you think about it, that when your heart and your lips come together, power is released. The Bible says if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and if you confess him with your mouth as Lord, you will be saved. Now you might be sitting there thinking, well, man, I, I, you know, I do believe in Jesus. Great, you're halfway there. You've got the heart part right. But most people fall down on the confession part. You need to put your lips together with your heart. Let heart and lips agree. Believe with your heart, confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and you will be saved. If you've never done it, why not confess him as the Lord of your life? You know, it, it is a commitment, and when it comes out of your lips and it touches together with your heart, something happens. You, you're washed clean, you're, you're given a fresh start. Jesus called it being born again. Uh, the Apostle Paul called it being regenerated, becoming a new creation in Christ Jesus. This is not like making some New Year's resolution to try and live better. But when heart and lips come together, literally the Holy Spirit comes in and makes a new creation out of you. He cleanses your heart, takes that heart of stone out, puts a heart of flesh in you, and you begin to walk and talk with your Creator. I dare you to do it. It's, been what, you, it's what you've been looking for your whole life, my friend. Call on Jesus' name today. Where is your hope? That's a question that deserves an answer. Finding answers to cope with the stress of the daily grind is difficult, but that is why Answers with Bayless Conley is here, on air with you right now, bringing our living Savior to our dying world, revealing hope to the lost, bringing answers to life's deep and most difficult questions. Today, we are asking you to play a vital role in reaching our world with the hope of Jesus Christ through your support. And to thank you for your support, we would like to send you a copy of Pastor Bayless Conley's powerful booklet, Footprints of Faith. The Bible tells us to walk in the footprints or to follow the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham has had. And he's actually left several very distinct footprints in the sands of time. That if you'll follow his faith and the pattern of his faith, you can have the same type of results that he had. This is going to help you. Call the toll-free number on the screen or visit AnswersBC.org to get your copy. Again, for your gift to help us take our living Savior to a dying world, we'll send you a copy of Footprints of Faith to help you grow in faith with this easy-to-read book. Call today. Thank you for helping reach the lost and hurting with the answers they long for. Answers found in Jesus Christ.